Hi everyone, this is Cricket with Louisville Creative Arts Academy, and we are excited to be joining you again um, via Zoom and um, to, to share a little bit more about the resources we have during this crazy time that everybody's going through. So it is my pleasure. This week we're going to shift gears a little bit and um, have invited someone to come and join us who is um, a teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. And she is, I'll let her introduce herself a little bit, but um, she, along with our task force leader, Jen Pearson, are going to have a dialogue today, sort of interview style, about um, the teacher's perspective of home educating and um, navigating resources that people are being given um, to work with their children at home. And so we have some great um, information to pass along to you today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Jen Pearson. Jen? Thanks, Cricket. So today we have Kelly Rowe, who's a teacher, and she will be joining us, as Cricket said, and I'm excited to have a teacher joining us today because I think she'll bring a perspective that I, as a homeschool parent, can't bring and can answer some of the questions that I've been hearing from people who have children in school. So I'm just going to dive right into some of the questions that I've gotten recently. So Kelly, my first question is, I know we've heard a lot about how hard this is for parents and how much parents are struggling and, and I guess even kids are kind of struggling with this transition to online learning. I want to know, how is it for you as a teacher? I can imagine that it must be somewhat difficult. It is. Um, thank you all for having me on today. It is extremely difficult. I've been teaching for 18 years. Um, I have taught everything from fourth grade to eighth grade. And um, I currently teach seventh and eighth grade social studies. And then I'm the dean of our middle school. Um, it is incredibly difficult because I am a hands-on person. I have a theatrical background. I am a performer. And that's what I think teaching a lot of teaching is. It's performing. And all of my lessons are hands-on lessons, um, especially in social studies, we do a lot of creating an ancient world to bring that ancient world to life. In eighth grade, it's US history and my classroom is deba debate focused. So we do a lot of conversations. We do a lot of debate with each other and it is extremely difficult to take those in-class style lessons and now transform them into something that can be conveyed digitally. But in, in the classroom, I have 50 minutes five days a week. And you know, if we run you know, over that time or if I don't get to something here, I have to condense what I would love to ultimately to teach into like a 15 minute mini lesson because I know that I am up against all of the distractions that these kids are facing in their homes. So it's really causing teachers to look at those lessons and figure out what is the most important thing that they wanna get across. And then how do I do that in a format that students can do on their own, at least at the middle school level. I know it's a little bit different when you start talking about elementary and then with high schoolers, but we are transforming all of our base of information into a completely different way of teaching. And so it's been incredibly stressful and I have, I've actually put more hours in these last few weeks than um, I usually do during the school week. So it's, it's hard, it's, it's stressful. I can imagine that would take a lot of effort to translate what you had been doing in person to suddenly a totally different format. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, are you doing like live video chats or do you record a video that you give to your students? So both. So we are using Zoom um, at our school. And so every class, at least in the middle school, meets twice a week for Zoom. So I see my seventh and eighth graders once on Monday and then once on Thursday. So I had them today. Um, and so I've kind of flipped the lessons. So I'll send out an assignment that I want them to complete the day before we meet. And then they are to read it and think about it and analyze it. And then we come together on our Zoom meeting and then we have the critical discussion. So for example, yesterday, or, and I usually give them two days. So on you know, yesterday, Wednesday, I sent out the Frederick Douglass 4th of July speech. And then today we came together 
and we discussed it as a whole class and, and we problem solved and, and we went over those. Um, but I also created a YouTube channel that is private so you can access it if you're just Googling on YouTube and I will upload pre-taught videos. And I know a lot of our grammar, language arts and math teachers are doing that as well because they have more kind of step-by-step -step directions, concrete thoughts that they need to get across. Um, and so they will upload those videos um, send the link to the kids, the kids will watch them, and then they meet twice a week as well uh, to help answer questions. So there is no real teaching over Zoom, it's more a check-in. And then on Fridays, we have what we're calling office hours. So I will be available for an hour tomorrow. Anyone who has any questions that need a face-to-face -face answer, uh, they can pop in, ask their question, and then pop back out again. So we're trying to incorporate a lot of different ways of getting a hold of these kids because a lot of it is interacting with them. I miss their faces. I miss their voices. So I want to see them as much as I can without it becoming too big of a stress on their part or their parents' part. That sounds great. I, I used to teach at Bellarmine. I taught psychology. And I think it almost sounds like you're doing a little bit more like college classes. So I, mm -hmm. even though I know it's difficult for everyone, I wonder if this might in the end be kind of a good thing that they're getting used to this format. I, I, I hope so, especially for it's, and I, again, my perspective is from the middle school point of view, but a lot of the parents feel the need really to sit down with their middle schoolers and go through everything with them. And this is also a really good lesson to say, this is a really good chance for you to back away. And we're not doing too much. We, the first two weeks, I think we did a lot and then we had a spring break. So then we were able to regroup, reassess, see what was working, see what wasn't working. And then now we've made those changes and we've put those changes in place. And again, it's about creating a sense of independence. You know, we ultimately want kids to take ownership of their learning. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with parents, you know, they are not in the classrooms with us in normal times. So while um, I do invite the parents to some of my lessons, you know, I really want students to take charge of their own schedules and, and everything. So I'm hoping that, yes, after all of this is done, they're going to be a little bit more prepared maybe than they would have been. You know, we're all looking for a silver lining, and that is definitely one of the positives that can come out of this. Well, that sounds great. So what would you recommend parents do? Obviously we don't want, or you don't want them to step in and take over and like try to handhold their children too much, mm -hmm. but what would you recommend that they do if they're having a hard time helping their children, their children are somehow struggling with the work and the parent just doesn't know how to help? And, and let me say a story that happened just yesterday with my own three children. So I have three kids, um, fourth grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade. And the ninth grader is basically on her own. She's in high school, I've, I've written her off, she's, she's fine. I taught fourth grade for 12 years before moving to middle school. So I, I, I could be my son's fourth grade teacher, like I've done it all before. And he had this project that was two weeks, it was about the Statue of Liberty. And he was just really struggling, he hit a wall. And I came to realize that while I love my son and I know my son, I actually don't know how he learns best all of the time because I'm not his primary teacher. So I, I don't know all of the strategies that work specifically with him. And the best person who did was his teacher. So I reached out to her, uh, his teacher. They have thankfully shared a lot of cell phone numbers and, and other ways to get a hold of them. And I said, can you pop on Zoom real fast? and help Jack calm down and explain this. And she got on and within 20 minutes, he was in a better mood. She was able to talk him off the ledge because she knew how to reach him academically. You know, I, I was getting frustrated as many of us are when our kids aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I was getting frustrated, which then wasn't helping the situation at all. So parents, don't be afraid to contact your teachers at all. Um, I have a meeting set up with a couple tomorrow to talk about workload. I'm getting daily emails from parents, you know, asking questions. I, I encourage the students, I will Zoom with you. I will, I will email with you. We can cut things off. We can, you know, if it's not enough, we can add more on. But 
that person, that teacher is going to be your best resource uh, because they know your students um, academically. And, and that is who my go-to is. I, as a teacher, I defer to all of their teachers. They, they, are, they are the mentors. They are the pros at, at teaching my own children. And that's a really good point. I've, I've told quite a few of my friends, I'm like, hey, if they're giving you too much or too little or you're having trouble, just talk to the teachers. Because I think the teachers want to keep that line of communication open as well. Our ultimate goal is for every student to succeed, period. And we know as teachers that even when I'm in the classroom, I will have maybe 18 students, I have 18 different ways of getting to that end result. So while my topic may be um, the Civil War, let's say, which is what I'm coming up to, in my classroom, I may have 18 different paths that I know I've got to hit for every kid to succeed. That is not it hasn't changed. So I understand that my blanket lesson is not going to be the best for every student. So I need those students to say, hey, Miss Rowe, I am really struggling with this. I need some help. And so I had a middle school student reach out to me. So I emailed all of their teachers and I said, what can we do to help? And those teachers were like, great, we'll cut the homework down. Um, extra time. Um, you know, we will have an extra Zoom meeting if needed we are willing to work with parents, but we don't know unless someone reaches out to us. Uh, we, I can look at you in my classroom and know you have a question. I can tell within a minute a kid is lost, but I've lost that ability in my house. So it is really important that uh, we reach out to teachers and let them know. And you bring up a really good point because as a homeschool mom, my kids were in school for a couple of years, um, kindergarten and first grade for my daughter. And uh, she was in school before I started homeschooling. And I always really struggled with helping her with homework and things like that. But now that I've been homeschooling for several years, it's so much easier because mm -hmm. like you said, you understand their learning style, you know how to reach them. So I think that's one thing that parents are really struggling with right now is figuring that out. Yes. And if the teachers can help with that, that's wonderful and a wonderful resource that they need to be sure to make use of. Yeah, I, I was hiding in my bathroom. I will not lie about this. I was hiding <laughs> in my bathroom yesterday um, True. in my bathtub because my brain was about to ooze out of my head. Like my son's fourth grade math, math problems about threw me over the edge. And again, 18 years of experience, three children, and I had no idea how to help him. And that's when you have to reach out to the experts. You have to reach out to the teachers and say, it's too much. Or can I have an extra day? Or can we cut it in half? Um, because none of us know all of these answers. It is okay not to know the answers to your children's homework. Like you have permission not to know all of this. Um, we just have to know what to do if that happens. That makes sense. Hey. And I, I think as a homeschool parent, it's a little bit different for us. I think there are a lot of things we can help with, with parents who are trying to figure this out. But one thing that I learned when I started homeschooling was that it's just very different to do work that comes from a teacher and someone else versus work that I have from a curriculum I've chosen or work that I have kind of designed for them. So mm -hmm. it is somewhat different. And so I just, I, I have the utmost respect for all the parents who are doing this right now. It's not an easy job. It's hard. All the teachers who are doing it right now, I can only imagine how hard that is. So you guys are our troopers and yeah. <laughs> working hard at this day by day day minute by minute I should say not even day by day minute by minute there you go well we have a question down in the comments so let's see um either one of you can chime in on this what if they are just getting too much they being your children are just getting too much work for your child each day what if it's just too much mm -hmm. I know I've heard a lot of that from friends of mine, especially when they have multiple teachers, the question, and I wonder, how do you handle that? Say your kid has five or six different classes and all the teachers are sending work. How do you do that? That is when it's really important that on the teacher side, which is a, something that you all are not going to see that they are communicating. You know, we as teachers have weekly meetings still, we are constantly, um, asking each other what we're, what they're doing so that we can adjust as needed but that is, you're gonna have to reach out to your teacher. And what I, what I would love as a, a teacher myself 
is to know exactly what a workload is. So I don't know if it's um, like middle school at Seton where I teach, we have an online system. So I would recommend a parent taking a picture of all of the work that is due on one day and then sending it to me so that I can see what that workload is. Or if it was brought home in a packet or mailed home, take a picture of it because again, your, your son or daughter's teacher is gonna know what is too much. And they may be able to look at that load and say, oh, absolutely, and then go from there. Um, but to, when parents say they have too much work, my first question always is, what are they doing? And how much time are they spending on it? So I would have a parent say they're spending an hour on these 10 math problems, or they spend 30 minutes on this vocab. And that way, it allows me to see what their total day looks like. And from there, then I can adjust or ask other teachers to adjust as needed. So my, my long answer is to take a picture, write what they have down, and then send it to, to a teacher. So how much time do you think they should be spending? And I assume that varies by grade, but what do you think would be reasonable given that it's a different yeah. situation than a classroom day? Right. So I, I actually reached out. I'm going to look down at my, my email. I reached down to some of my friends who teach um, elementary because, like I said, I'm middle school, so it's a little bit different. And I have no idea um, what the little people are doing, little kids are doing. But they said, on average, it's going to be about 60 minutes, maybe throughout the day. And again, all of them said it's not at one time they may do you know, 15 minutes of math and then take a 30 minute break or a 45 minute break or go outside for an hour and then come back and maybe do 20 minutes of reading. They all said reading was very important. You know, Picture books, magazines, um, it doesn't have to be a chapter book. There's lots of different ways to read. Audio books, go online and, and listen to a story. Um, and then there might be one day where there's assignment for social studies or another day where there's science but they said overall they may have about an hour and again it all depends on how fast your student works uh some students like to sit down and just get it done and then have the rest of the day to themselves some kids like to take regular breaks at the middle school level i can say that each class is sending home about 30 to 40 minutes of work and again some of our assignments are week long so like our math at middle school level, they had about 40 math problems to do, but they had Monday to Friday. So they can divide that up however they need to. Um, I tend to have two to three day lessons. So I'll assign a lesson Monday and it's due Wednesday and then Wednesday due Friday or due the following Monday. So it may seem like a lot, but then they have multiple days to get it done. Um, so again, in high school, like I said, I have no idea because Casey's upstairs doing it by herself. But um, I would think it, it's gonna, as your son or daughter gets older, it's going to increase. So a first grader is gonna have less than a second grader. And then a second grader should have a little bit less than the third grader. But I would think about an hour for the little kids and then it just works its way up from there. That makes sense. So for your students in middle school, I, I'm trying to understand, you said about 30 to 40 minutes per class. So what does that look like? each day? Like what should a parent expect their child to be doing on a daily basis, just time-wise, I guess? So we suggested that they follow their school schedule. So let's say on a Monday they have math first period. Um, we suggested they follow it. So they do math first thing and then they transition to whatever their next class is, language arts. Um, now a kink in that is that we have our Zoom schedule. So if you have a Zoom meeting that day and our Zoom meetings are about 15 minutes, then you usually don't have an assignment. That's usually the assignment is to log on and talk to us, you know, make eye contact. Um, but for middle school, we have told all parents to create a schedule. So for my own daughter, she works for about 45 minutes um, and that might be one or two subjects. And then she takes a break for about 30, 45 minutes. And then she comes back and she works again. Um, she breaks it up. So it's not a full school day, but we wanna make sure that they're still engaged and they're still learning. Um, most of our students can finish if they start around eight or nine around lunch, uh, a little bit after, but then you have some eighth graders, as I've come to find out, who would prefer to sleep till noon and then do all their work in the afternoon. So kudos to them. That's, that's fine. Um, like my daughter. <laughs> whatever. That's right. Um, 
I am, uh, the teachers are available at my school from eight to three. So if you email us anytime between eight to three, you're gonna get an immediate response. After three, it, we may not respond right away. So I've told those eighth graders, you gotta be careful not to sleep too long. You're gonna miss out on, on prime question time. That makes sense. Um, okay, I'm trying to think, let's see, I had a few other questions that I wrote down that friends have, have asked me or other people have asked me. And let's see what my next one is. Um, so I've talked to some friends who are really struggling with the fact that they have to work from home and their kids have to do school from home and they're trying to manage that and, and sort of keep tabs on their kids and make sure they're doing their schoolwork and that kind of thing. I know, like you said, they don't have to sit in on the classes and mm -hmm. shouldn't probably be micromanaging, but how much do they need to be doing or what do you think they should do with that? It's hard. I am um, my first two weeks of online learning at Seton, the Lexington Fayette County schools didn't have session. They were off. So I had two weeks of my daughter and I, cause she goes to the same school and I was rocking it. Like I had it. And then Fayette County had a week where I didn't. And I was like, this is so easy. They're doing their own stuff. And then this week hit where all of us were on. And that's why I haven't showered. Like it's a daily struggle in my house. And like, for instance, today, it, it's been constant. If I'm not meeting with one class, I'm helping a child with math homework. Or if um, I had two Zooms back to back and then I had two children wanting their help and then I had another one at a Zoom at three, like it is hard. And I don't think I have a magic answer because I haven't found one yet. Um, I think the important thing to do is to cut everyone some slack. You don't have to be perfect. If you are having a hard day at work yourself, email, like I would love an email from a parent and say, Kelly, we just had a hard night last night. Can they have another day? Yes, because I may have to send that as for my own children's teachers. Like it is, we are all in the same boat and we are all struggling and all of our families are different, but we all have that same concern of how do you balance everything and it's it's an impossible situation that we just have to to do the best we can I send my children out of this house at every moment like if it's sunny get out like go run around go collect rocks I don't I don't care and then I can at least get something done for like well five minutes before someone argues with someone but you know for a little bit of time um writing handwritten notes. A lot of teachers have said that they are encouraging their kids to write their teacher notes, not type, but the art of just writing someone a postcard or writing someone a letter that they could do by themselves or, um, you know, tend to a garden. I tend to keep my kids alive, but I can't keep plants alive very well. But in this time, my children have loved taking care of the, the flowers out there. So I just have to be real creative of what I can have them do just so I can have a moment to myself. And um, it, I'm not, it's hard. I don't know if I have an answer right now, maybe in a month, if I make it. That was it. a great answer though. I mean, I think okay. you bring up a great point that mental health is so important right now. Yes. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that because mm -hmm. we're used to when work is sent home, we make it, the kids do it and nothing gets in the way. And right. I think it's important to sort of take a step back and give ourselves some just patience and some time mm -hmm. and give our kids that same patience to say, you know, it's okay sometimes if we can't get it all done. And I think kids are stressed, parents are stressed. It's a weird time. So I if think our kids see us stressed, then that's gonna add to their stress level. And, and it's hard not to be stressed around our kids. I mean, we've all got, you know, adults in the room have, the financial burden that we're worried about. And, you know, if my husband, who's a pastor, that adds a whole nother dynamic on the amount of people that he may be coming in contact with. And I have to be very aware of what I am portraying at any given time to my kids. Now, today, I literally looked at them and said, get out, because I was having a moment where I just needed some space. And they're older, so that they're used to that. But the thing that I write home, I have to write a morning message to my middle school students every day. And it's the same message. Ask for help. Tell us when it's too much. Your mental health is the top priority. Everyone in the fall is going to be behind academically. It's just a fact. Everyone is going to be behind academically. So we're all going to be in the same boat. 
you know, I can't start if we are lucky enough to go back to school in August. There's no way I can start at the same place I constantly do every other year. I'm going to have to backtrack and play a little bit of catch up. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Everyone is going to be doing the same thing. So we have to be able to look at ourselves and say, it's okay to take a day. It's okay to tell everyone to put their computers down and say, you know what, we all need a break. It's okay to want to bang your head against the wall. Um, but mental health is the number one priority, or it should be every teacher's number one priority. I think that's great, Kelly. I completely agree because I think this, this is a hard time for all of us. And I've been homeschooling for five years and it was still a difficult transition to say, nope, sorry, you can't get together with friends. We can't go Mm -hmm. on field trips. We can't go to the zoo. We can't go play on the playground, all those things that we were used to doing. And, and of course my kids overhear the news. I've had to kind of stop listening to it in front of them because it was causing stress. Yes. So it's a hard Yeah, time. we had, we, we love watching Andy at five o'clock, like yeah. he does, and we've had to stop doing that just because of the kids were picking up on it too much. But I made a video on Facebook a week ago where I said it, you know, to some extent, we are all mourning a type of life that is no longer around. You know, we are, I am more, I was mourning, I was having a really hard, hard few days, and it's because I was sad. I was mourning the fact that I don't have my classroom anymore. I was mourning the fact that I don't get to see my coworkers in person anymore. I was mourning the fact that I didn't get to goof off and give a hard time to these students all the time. And it's hard. Everyone has to kind of take that moment to say, it's okay to be sad that things aren't like they are anymore. And we have to realize as adults, teachers, parents, educators, everyone that, yes, academics are important. No one's arguing that. But is eighth grade social studies the end-all be-all? No, because they're going to have it again in high school. You know, is fourth grade math the end-all be-all? No, because at the end of the day, they're going to get that content again next year. But this time for our students psychologically and emotionally, mentally, is so important. Um, it just, it cannot be understated just how important everyone's mental health is. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I hope everybody hears that loud and clear because yes, I think I said it in one of our other live streams. I think that kids will someday look back on this and it will be a major life event for them. This Mm -hmm. is going to go down in history. It's something their children and grandchildren will ask them about, and they're probably not going to remember all the details of what they learned in school but they'll Mm -hmm. remember how they felt and they'll remember how it impacted them. Mm -hmm. So I hope that parents and teachers can all work together to try to make this. I mean, I know you can't make it a great raw, raw, positive experience, but to make it at least as, as little, um, or as, how do I want to say it, but as, as less unpleasant as possible. Yes. I've spent a lot of time over the last weeks trying to figure out how to make it fun, which is almost impossible to do. But like this week at our school in middle school, we're doing a cereal bracket, like it's called milk madness. (laughs) And would everyone fill out a bracket about cereal? And then there's live voting every day. And right now we're in the sweet 16 and that is taking up so much of my time, but I had such a huge response and I even have parents doing it now because they think it's fun. It's these little things that we are trying to do to lighten up what is a hard experience. And Mm -hmm. the the sooner parents can admit that it's hard and it's okay to ask for help and it's okay not to be perfect, then the sooner you can start de-stressing a little bit and and giving yourself time. Yeah, I totally agree, Kelly. That's great. Cricket, you look like you might have another Facebook comment. Is there another question or were you just looking at your screen? Oh, you're muted. Yep. My dog was barking, so I've <laughs> mute, m- muted my room over here. Yeah, we do have another question. Um, it says, should parents supplement the learning at home in some way? Or do you have any suggestions for educational things they could do at home? Um, I would say, do not feel like you have to supplement at all. Um, because the teachers are probably giving you what they feel is adequate. 
Now, if you would like to do extra things, I do not go out and buy things. Do not go online and buy resources, but you can bake cookies because that is math and science right there. And it's actually reading, reading a recipe, uh, talking about measurement and then physical and chemical changes. Three subjects, baking cookies. And how fun is that? And then you get the cookie afterwards. Um, like I said, planting a garden, if you have the space, or you could talk about perimeter and area and, and measure those things. Those are the types of things that as teachers, we want, we want to see. Um, you could have them measure your front yard and then, you know, spray paint or, or something on the grass, you know, like a soccer field. You could get creative, but I would strongly advise parents not to go out and buy workbooks or you know, go online. There's a lot of good resources if you wanted those types of things, but really the kids already have enough paper and pencil work. Um, the pen pal idea, you know, they could write letters to their classmates. And I know my kids, when they get mail of any kind, are thrilled. This might bring back the post office. Like if we could get away from the computer screens and have them start writing letters to people. I am, um, I sent a letter to all of my middle schoolers, just a little postcard. And I got so many replies on how excited they were to get a piece of mail. Like it was unbelievable. So it's, it's those little things I think you can do. So, you know, cooking is always good. Um, puzzles are fabulous. Reading at all times, they could be reading, but again, it could be graphic novels, comic books. It could be audio books. Um, there's a lot of free resources. A lot of the public libraries have, you know, the audio books now that you can download. Those are, those are great. Um, I, I saw one of my friends start a book club with their children. So they found like a Beverly Clearly book, which are, which are easy. And they all sat around and they read it and they asked questions. Um, some of the older kids are finding books that have a movie attached. So they're reading the, the book together as a family. And then they're all gonna have a movie night where they watch the movie and then compare and contrast the book to the movie. Um, it's an activity that I used to do with fourth graders. Like we would read Bridge to Terabithia and then watch the movie and then compare and contrast. So there's a lot of things you could do that aren't paper and pencil that I would highly suggest. We do things like that, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah. we do somebody have- somebody saying something? Uh, me. Yep, go um, ahead. I was just gonna say that on our website, um, we've compiled and are still compiling a list of resources and even created a resource page. And it's not so much like paper and pen work, mm -hmm. but I guess you would say like enrichment activities that could go along with basically any subject. You know, mm -hmm. ours have an emphasis in creative arts because that's what we do. Um, but, you know, things like museum tours and, mm -hmm. um, and, and from places all around the world, you know, like you can really, um, especially if you're just looking for something to fill the time, you know, um, you know, there are, there are lots of resources and that's really one of the main reasons why we wanted to start this is to just homeschool parent, homeschooling parents have like the corner, the market cornered on <laughs> for home education. So um, mm -hmm. we, we started just compiling those, you know, and it's not curriculum, it's just additional things you can do. I think that's great. My oldest daughter, um, she's a freshman. She created a scavenger hunt for the family. And oh, she, out and she, I mean, it was like a three hour scavenger hunt, if you know my daughter. And, uh -huh. but I mean, she, she hid clues all around the house and then each clue created a puzzle and that's all her thing, but it was fun. And then that made my 12 year old want to do one. Um, so she did a smaller version. Um, and uh, they did like a truth or dare game where we had to pick something out of a bowl and then we had to do it. And it was super easy, super fun, um, but still it got them thinking. Those are sequential things that they had to do. They had to work out sequence and order. They had to plan it in advance. And those are skills that you don't get from a textbook. And it takes up time. And it takes up time. And because it was secret, we couldn't help her. So, hey. right. I love that. I used to make scavenger hunts for my kids and I really need to do it again, but I would try to incorporate their school subjects into it. So they would have to like solve a math problem and then they would 
like unlock something with that number mm -hmm. and things like that. So they really enjoyed those. But those were a little bit of work for me. Now, if I could now get one of my kids to make it for and, the others, that would right. work. And it's great because she got so into it. And I mean, she is that type of person, but she even had us leave the house. So we got, we took a walk and she was like arranging it everywhere. So we wouldn't see where everything was hidden. Um, and it got everyone involved. So I, I had a good time. I had a good time. Sounds like they're learning some creativity skills too. That's right. That's, That's right. great. So I just wanted to briefly go back to what you were saying about comparing um, movies and, to mm -hmm. books. My kids love to do that. I always, it's kind of almost my bribe sometimes to get them yes. to read a classic book that may not be the most engaging. Mm -hmm. I'll say, well, there's a movie. And once you read the book, you can watch the movie. So that right. always works. So I got them to read Call of the Wild recently because the movie was coming out in theaters. Mm -hmm. So after they finished it, we went to see it. And then my daughter discovered that there's numerous versions of Call of the Wild movies that have been made over time. And I read an article about how they kind of cleaned it up to make it more culturally acceptable now and politically mm -hmm. correct now, because there were a lot of things that really weren't very culturally nice, I right. guess you could say, in the original. And so I was mentioning that to her and she said, well, now I want to go back and watch all the different versions of the movie and compare all of them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that could even, you could really incorporate history and yep. how people's views of things have changed over time and how our view of different cultures has changed mm -hmm. and how different cultures were maybe treated wrongly in the past and all sorts of yes. things. So really, I think we just, we have the resources. We just need to make use of them. Right. We, um, in my seventh grade, it's ancient world civilizations. And so we do a lot of ancient China. And so we study Mulan, like the real person. And it's really just a ballad It's called the ballad of Mulan. And this whole story of Mulan came from one single poem in one book. So that is another easy activity. You can read the poem, which we do. Um, and if you go to teacher pay teachers, uh, which is a great website, there's a lot of free resources on Mulan, but then we watch the movie, the Disney version, and you compare and contrast. We did the same thing with uh, Pocahontas. The Pocahontas Disney version has a lot of flaws. And so what we do is we talk about who the real people were and then we talk about the history and then we watch the movie and then they have to tell me what changes were made and kind of try to figure out for the older kids, why did they make those changes? Um, you could do a lot with, with historical references in, in current movies. Um, national, not national treasure. Um, well, national treasure is a good one for older kids, but Night at the Museum is a great movie because it, he, of course he's at a museum. And so you could break that down and really talk about Teddy Roosevelt uh, in one of them. You could talk about the Egyptian pharaohs in another one of them. I mean, you can really take it and dissect it. And that could be a whole week full of activities for you. Um, so you just have to think outside the box. I know there are a lot of parents out there that are probably thinking, I'm not looking for more to do. <laughs> right. But, but it would be fun, you know, for your kids if, if you had them watch a movie, but you told them to look for things. I mean, that is, you put them in front of a movie and say, if you know the movie, or you could probably just Google some of the answers, you know, what, what artifact is mentioned from ancient Egypt. And then you give them the questions that might be a little prep work up front, but then they're quiet for a whole two hours and you can go outside and read a book or, or, or you know, do whatever. So that's a great idea. I think, and that might really be beneficial to parents that are trying to work and need something mm -hmm. to keep their kids occupied, but they don't want it to just be mindless screen time. Right. So that could be really beneficial. And I do think, you know, we're, we hear a lot about tech time or screen time. And for me, and this is just my opinion, that watching a movie with a point of view, with a guide, like you are watching it for a purpose is different than sitting in front of a video game playing mindlessly for, for hours. You know, I would rather have my children all be sitting around, pop popcorn, make a tent, whatever, but they're all looking for th things while they're watching this movie than to sit there and just, you know, zone out watching wrestling or whatever the latest thing on TV is. Yeah, I would agree. I think not all screen time is created equal. It is not. I, I agree with you. I don't think it all, all is either. 
I think even the American Academy of Pediatrics has recently acknowledged that and they've removed their, their hour um, recommendations of limits and they've said that it's more looking at what they're not doing because mm -hmm. they're on screens and making sure there's a balance and also making sure it's good quality screen time. So I think yeah. I think our views of screen time are changing over time mm -hmm. and I'm glad to see that because That's good. I think there's a lot more to it than just it's a screen. Right. Some, some of it's beneficial. Some of it is absolutely beneficial time. Um, there's a lot of free resources for math review, um, for language arts review. And, you know, sometimes they do get more out of it coming on a screen than if you put a piece of paper and a pencil in front of their, you know, you do have to balance it. I agree. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to look at with my kids because they, they do love their video games, as I think most kids do. And I find a lot of the games, even ones that aren't intentionally or overtly educational, they learn a lot, even if it's just strategy, planning ahead, um, kind of you know, being able to rally a team behind you and come up with a common goal and th things like that. And it's funny because if you said to somebody, well, my kid's playing chess you know, five hours a day, they would be right. like, oh, that's wonderful. But if you say they're doing this strategy game on the computer five hours a day, people would think that was horrible. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's it's different. It. Uh, my students in seventh grade, again, se seventh grade for me, because it's ancient world, it's a lot of hands on. It's it's really a STEM class, but I, I teach it social, I do social studies. Their favorite project, they will tell you, is ancient China, and they have to create an artifact. And a lot of them use Minecraft. So they researched um the great wall of china all of the history of it the different parts the different emperors dynasties and all that and then a lot of them instead of building it with materials they built it virtually and i will tell you that the projects that i saw on minecraft were were well i mean they were excellent uh, because they were invested in it i had students create villages some more than what they could do in person so not only did they create the great wall but then they changed the materials uh because the great wall is not all the same material it changed by dynasty so then they were able to change the material they were able to create the villages on either side uh within the villages they were able to create the different housing structures and the farms and the different crops that the farms would grow uh, that they would grow in we did the same thing for ancient egypt they did the pyramids and then what you can't do in person is they went inside the pyramid and created the burial chambers and everything. So you, you, they are technical and, and sometimes you have to use that to your advantage, um, but it can absolutely be done. Absolutely be done. I would agree. I, I've used Minecraft a few times myself. We studied the uh, early American settlers and we mm -hmm. read a book that talked about how their settlement looked and what buildings were included and everything. And then as sort of a means of cementing the learning and also testing understanding, I had my daughter go on Minecraft and create a sort of a model of that settlement. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I could have done it with, you know, cardboard or plastic things, but that would have been a lot of mess and maybe expense. Right. Minecraft, you can get so much more detailed and you don't yep. have the problem of not having something. So. And they do it by themselves. Like that is another right. activity that you can let them do and the parents are out of it. So um, that's always an option for whatever you're studying right now. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, I, I hope that, I really hope there might be some teachers watching that will get some of these ideas from you because I think things like that, if the teachers can give students things where they can be creating and doing mm -hmm. fun things that they'll enjoy, yep. th and, but not necessarily requiring any help from parents. Like if you tell a kid to make something in the physical world that usually requires the parent to help. Yes, but and cost. I mean, if I were to ask a parent to build a model, they're gonna have to go to the store and get those supplies, which right now is not really possible anyway. Um, my biggest thing when I'm teaching is to ask myself, how do I get the kids to buy into what I'm doing? If they can buy into what I'm doing, um, my first goal is to build relationships because if they buy into me as a teacher, they're gonna do more for me. But then once I have them, how do I get them to buy into my lesson? And, and going to Minecraft a few years ago was one of the best things I've ever done. Now I do get parent permission. Uh, if they are gonna do Minecraft, I have to have a written note saying that, yes, I know my child is on Minecraft. Uh, but again, those projects over the last three years have far exceeded my expectations and they are really, really impressive. Now I do have excellent 
work that is done in per, like with the materials, with the, the hard materials. But it is something that I think parents and teachers need to keep in mind is especially these kids who are engineering focused. My oldest daughter um, in the pre-engineering program at Lafayette. So she does a lot of graphic design and those types of kids were really interested in the Minecraft because they see things in 3D. They see the entire process. They don't just see the outside of a shape. They can visualize what's inside of it. Now, I was not that person. I'm not, I'm not that person, but I appreciate those who are. That's great. Some really good ideas for things that parents can have their children do if they need mm -hmm. extra, or maybe teachers can get some ideas for things to assign that kids can do that will keep them occupied and not involve the parents as much. So um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, and actually Cricket, this, this might be a question for you too. We've talked a little bit about some things that kids can learn at home during this time. Again, I know some parents are overwhelmed. I'm not trying to add or make anybody feel like they need to add more to their plate. But I think there are some skills, maybe practical life skills that kids mm -hmm. can learn during this time that they, you know, you just can't teach at school as easily. And so we often hear complaints that kids grow up and they aren't able to adult, like they just aren't good at adulting and they don't have those skills. So Cricket, you have a grown son. What kind of skills did you find he needed when he first moved out that he couldn't have learned from school? I'm not gonna put you on the spot and ask if you knew him or not. But. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> he would always, he always says that I never taught him to cook. And so he's, that's not 100% true. Um, but I guess looking back, I wish that I had made more of a concerted effort to do it. Do you know what I mean? He was an only child. So I'll admit I did most everything for him. Um, but he also, I mean, like I did teach him some things, but I guess when he got fully independent and on his own, he wished he knew a little bit more. So I think this would be a great time to take advantage of, you know, like, especially for parents who are working while they're at home and educating their children, this would be a great, you know, like tonight, you're making dinner every Thursday, you know what I mean? And let's plan what that's going to be for the next couple of Thursdays and you know sort of I think that is an opportunity there um so I think any of those daily things the other thing I was going to say as you all were talking since we do have you know like there are a lot of parents who are trying to work and teach and you know run the house and everything how about um you know like a take your child to work day, but you're at home. And so like, if you have children that are old enough to do some tasks that would be helpful to your work at home, do you know what I mean? So for me, because I work at home a lot anyway, um, I have lots of mail to go through and, um, you know, just papers to file and, those kind of things that just sort of stack up in my life. And so that would be something that a child, I don't think Ryan's going to come over anytime soon and do that for me now, but um, if he were here, mm -hmm. um, you know, like they could actually help. And the, the main thing I was thinking while you were talking was, and one of the and like initiatives and values for LCAA is that children through arts education can learn practical career paths. And so we've seen proof of that in our filmmaking class and our photography class, um, you know, where students are learning practical skills that have influenced the career path or their, you know, like higher education path. And so this might be a time where, um, you know, if, students become aware of what mom or dad do for a living, um, you know, they, they could, you know, shadow for a day or, you know, but I think what I would say to parents is not that like we're trying to give you more and more and more work to do, but just think about the work that you do have to do differently, mm -hmm. you know, like, 
um, think about other ways, especially if you have a student and you've realized they're struggling in math or struggling in writing or whatever, what kind of activities can I be involved in while they're home, you know, that might help enrich, you know, the subject that they're struggling in. So I don't think it's, you know, like, let's add some more work to your plate. If, if you can think about it from the sense that, you know, like parents have the opportunity to think outside the box in ways that might help sort of like sear those concepts into their brains a little bit more. Mm -hmm. One of the activities that um, I've been doing, I haven't really been doing it, but my son gave me the idea. He, we went on a walk and he took his little device that is able to take pictures and he was taking pictures around the neighborhood. And so I thought he kind of struggles every now and then with alphabetical order, which I know a lot of people do. And so I came up with, you know, a scavenger hunt. He had to find, you know, 10 to five, 10 to 15 items, take pictures of them. And then when he came back, he had to put those pictures in alphabetical order by the subject. And it's an easy task that doesn't require anything at all. Right. Um, and it's just, you know, or if they're struggling with numbers, uh, for little kids, they have to take a picture of two rocks or three trees or five cars or, or whatever. Um, you can get really creative. You don't have to, you know, we're all money aware right now. So I, I agree with Cricket. You just have to kind of think outside the box, uh, but reach out. The, no one is doing this for the first, I mean, we're all, we're all asking for help. So I Google, the first thing I always do is, has someone already done it? And then I, I take that idea. I've very rarely come up with ideas on my own just because I don't have time to sit down and think of all new ideas. So I always, always look for ideas first. I think that's great. And again, don't want to add anything to anyone's mm -hmm. plate because I know everybody, almost everybody right now is feeling kind of overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But I, I like the idea of the practical skills where it could actually help you out. So I can see, depending on the age of your child, you could be working from home and say, hey, I need you to start dinner. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, could you make me a sandwich? And just little things like, you know, even like my nine-year-old can make a sandwich, but he doesn't like to, of course, and prefers for me to make it. But I've found if I am busy or something, and I'm like, if I tell him, hey, I can't do it right now, then he'll do it. So he gets practice at that practical mm -hmm. skill of being able to make a sandwich for himself or for me. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the skills like sorting, you know, laundry, um, we don't, we don't take the time to sort laundry ahead of time, but after it comes out of the dryer, it's someone's job to get it all out and then just sort it by person. And, and again, that is a sorting skill and you don't think about that, but it's actually a skill that comes in handy nearly every day, being able to classify things right. and if you're not in a big hurry to put laundry away, then you could have those little kids practice sorting the socks and sorting the shorts, not even by person. And then once they've done that, switch it up. Now, sort by color. And these little kids will jump on that and there's no skin off your back. Like you can sit there and keep working and then sort by number and one sock, two, three, you know, whatever. You can take these little tasks that we all not like to do all the time and, and make it make it fun. I was thinking if, if I could just interject while we've been talking about, you know, parents sort of now have a different perspective on how their children are learning and maybe they hadn't had the opportunity to really notice, mm -hmm. you know, I think if this had happened while I was raising Ryan, I would have seen some of the like firsthand struggles other than like me just every night going, you've got to do your homework. You're mm -hmm. so lazy or you're so whatever, you know what I mean? Don't procrastinate. But if, because you just sort of automatically assume it's just them being, well, when Ryan went to college as a freshman, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And he told me, mom, I have it. I know I have it. It's why I'm not doing good. And I was like, you do not have it we will go to the doctor right now and you do not have it. Cause I was like, I raised you. I right. brought you up. I got you through school, through the skin, you know, like, um, and sure enough, he was diagnosed with it. And so right now it's sort of like this window of opportunity. Parents can sort of see up close. My child is really struggling in this subject. 
Um, as a person who, uh, you know, I am a different learner and that's why arts education is really like super important to me. Um, and, and it means a lot to me because that's how I learn um, in a creative hands-on way. And um, parents, I think it would be really good advice at this time not to try to solve the problems that they're discovering, but make a note to themselves. Like I need to, as soon as I can, I need to, you know, talk to the teacher about this or that. Or, you know, like I see, you know, like the struggle is really in this area, but a real strength in this area. And maybe like one good thing coming out of that is that they learn the learning styles of their children. And, you know, like that's something that's like a definite, like practical benchmark that you can build on, you know, like when all is said and done and we are back, back in school and back in our normal next fall, um, you know, but now you've learned, now you've realized it. Now mm -hmm. you can say, oh, they weren't just making excuses. <laughs> they, they weren't just, you know, being lazy or being obstinate or whatever like you've you've been in the trenches with them and you mm -hmm. can say you know like oh this like this is why this is so hard for them you know and so I think I think that's one good way to look at it is you know not to get overwhelmed with trying to solve that problem right now you know like when you're in the trenches so to speak but make a note you know make a make a conscious effort to to have a discussion with the teacher to seek you know like other help in that subject area and and this has allowed you to be able to to figure that out mm -hmm. i do hope that something you know that that's one positive that can really come from this is that parents will be more aware of what's going on with their children and how to better help them with their homework when we return to normal school with normal homework and also that parents will be able to become an advocate for their kids and be able to tell a teacher, hey, I've noticed that my child has a hard time doing whatever it is. And, you know, because teachers change every year. So next school year, the parent may be a good resource for that teacher to be able to tell the next teacher the things that would help their child more. So I think that is one good thing that can come from this. Absolutely. And, and I would just remind people I saw a funny meme and I do not mean to, to make fun of this, but um, I saw something that said, well, maybe the teacher wasn't the problem. Like, you know, you see your kids and you're like, I was blaming everyone else, but my own child. And now I'm kind of, you know, but we are trained as teachers. Like I'm trained to adapt my lesson 1800 different ways. You are not as a parent. And so um, I do agree. I, I tell students, you have to be an advocate for yourself. You, you have a problem you need to email me, right? Your, your parent has already been through middle school. Um, they can assist you, but it is a good time, like we said earlier, to um, give students the confidence to solve their own problems. And you can be an advocate for them by helping them be an advocate for themselves. Um, because at some point you're not gonna be able to like, I really don't know many of Casey's high school teachers and I don't think they want emails from me at the high school level. Um, so it's a good chance for her to become an advocate for herself. I, I think that's great. So and those are really all the questions I had. I think we've covered all the ones that I've heard from people. Did you see any others in the Facebook feed, Cricket? No, ma'am. I think we answered the ones that came came up in the feed. I've heard from people. Did you see any others so, in the Facebook feed? I don't see any more that have popped up. Okay, well, Kelly, I really appreciate you joining us. You had some wonderful ideas and, and a great perspective. And I'm going to even use some of your ideas in my homeschooling. So I oh, hope good. some parents that are watching will also get some ideas. Yeah, and, and you, now you know how to get a hold of me. So feel free to um, give my email and, and people can contact me. I, I do love to talk. I do love a microphone. We all know this or cricket. And um, I, I love people. So I am, um, I'm glad I was able to help some people. Be careful Thank what you, you ask for Kelly, because I know you're That's already right. busy. I'm, 
<laughs> well, this is not my children related. So I'm, I'm happy to sit and answer other people's questions. It's my own children that I'm not as patient with. So um, this is fun. Plus, this has been an hour where everyone has known to leave me alone. So I'm, I might just sit here and pretend to keep talking to you all okay. for a while. <laughs> we won't uh, tell. My son came in a minute ago. Fortunately, the camera was on one of you guys and and I was like, nope, nope, on a live stream, go back out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much for doing this today. I think it was, it just gets better every week with such good content that I feel like um, so many people can relate to and utilize. Um, I just want to remind everybody um, that we do have a resource page on our website, louisvillecreativeartsacademy.com slash resources that we're updating um, every couple of days. I just put something up there um, new today and um, we'll go back through the video and pull any information, um, websites and that kind of thing that we can post for people to find. Um, Kelly, I invite you to feel free to send any, any resources you think are would be beneficial to parents. Okay. And um, next week, I think we're going to try and have a parent on as um, our interview and, um, you know, see how they're doing. I know here for our program at LCAA, we're almost finished for the year. Um, but um, our public and private schools still have a while to go. So um, we'll keep putting out information. Um, but thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time and your your resources and intelligence and and being willing to to give your input. So I appreciate it so much. Thank, thank you. you, Cricket, for having me again. Yes. And for of course, us all together in the beginning. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it for you both. It's so. been fun. All right. Well, I'll see you all. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.